Welcome back to MVM. Today we have an Essen review. This is for Carpe Diem, Stefan Feld's next game from Aaliyah and Ravensburger. You're probably already going to buy this one, but if you're on the fence, check out this review. Yeah, a spoiler alert. I mean, we are Stefan Feld fans. I'm sure. in particular a, a huge fan. And some of his games have been not exactly... I mean, there's a range of his games, sure. for sure. Yeah. Uh, but we do we do like this one quite a bit. So this one takes place in exactly 1 BC. And what we're doing is we're trying to build estates on our player board. This player board is broken into a 6 by 6 grid in which we're going to be drafting tiles and then playing them onto the board. You're also going to notice a frame around the board. Each of us is going to start with one of these and then four of these random frames. These frames are going to dictate possible points that you can get for placing buildings in very distinct locations on here. So not only are you trying to build the right buildings, but you're also trying to build them in the right locations. And of course, we also have the main board here, and there's a number of different things on here, mainly tiles. As you see here in the main part of the board is a seven-pointed star, if you will, where all of the main tiles are going to be placed around in each round. These are going to be drafted throughout the game, and of course, you also have these tiles, which are very similar, but they have a slightly darker back. These are going to be acquired in a different way. All of these tiles are going to go on to your player board. And then over here on the left, you're going to see the scoring cards. Now, this is a really interesting part of the game. There are a ton of these different scoring cards, and these are going to go out randomly from four different Stats. collections of scoring cards out here and the scoring is probably one of the most interesting things about this game we'll get to that in a second also across the top of the board you're going to see the banda roll track uh, the banda roll in ancient times is basically a scroll this is going to serve two purposes in the game one it's going to dictate whoever is the furthest in the lead at the end of each round to place their scoring marker first on this chart that you see here. Also, it's just pure in-game victory points at the end of the game. You're gonna see victory point cards. Uh, there's no scoring track in this. They're handled by cards in this yep. game. You're gonna see some fountain cards. These are collected by placing very specific buildings in your estate. These are gonna serve as in-game victory points for meeting very specific requirements. And then you have the resources. Yeah, the resources are, very few actually because you're going to be collecting these and hopefully converting them into money that's a wild resource which we have here and then of course bread bread is going to be the resource that allows you to break a couple of the rules in the game also each player is going to have this board here it's going to show you how the buildings piece together and how you gain resources plus all the in-game victory points which we'll get into all right so to start the game each player is going to place their board in front of them with a random set of four frames around it they're going to place these little band roll markers onto each of the spaces that show one and you're going to determine a first player and then you're going to play the game is extremely easy to play all you're doing is you're taking your patrician uh, which are randomly placed at the start of the game and you're moving along one of the two lines that connects from the area that you start in so this guy here can either move to this section or to this section. Any number of patricians can occupy the same spot. When you move to that new location, you're simply going to take one of the tiles, any tile that you wish, and place it on your board. Now, the very first one that you place has to be placed over the shovel at the start of the game, but you can place in any orientation that you so wish. Yeah, and some of the other rules as you start placing are what you might expect. All the sides of a tile have to match up with any other tiles that you already have placed, and as you place tiles throughout the game, they have to be placed adjacent to tiles that you've already placed. The border around the, the entire player board is treated as grass, which are going to be on some of the tiles around the edges, so you have to honor that as well. Anytime you finalize or complete a structure, you're going to get something from that. All the buildings provide something, and all the different farmlands provide something. There's four different basic types of resources according to these wooden tokens here. You have fish, you have chicken, you have grapes, and then you have leaves, leaves of some sort. Uh, anytime you complete those type of buildings, you're going to gain the resources for them. So the actual farmland works a little bit different from the buildings. I'll describe yeah. the farmland. Anytime you complete a farmland, you're going to count how many tiles it took to complete that piece of farmland. If it was two tiles, it's two minus one. If it's four farm tiles, it's four minus one. So it's always one less than the number of pieces that you use to complete it. And you're simply going to take those resources and you're going to put them on your player board for use at a later time. Yeah, the buildings work just about the same except all of the buildings are just 
always going to be two tiles. There's no extensions in the middle or anything like that. So when you complete a building, you're going to have a number of different effects that occur. Sometimes you're going to be collecting things, like for a brown building, you'll collect two bread. For a gray building, you'll actually move up on the banner roll track. Uh, the yellow building lets you convert things into money, for instance, which I said again, money is the wild resource. And the green buildings are going to let you pick any one of these tiles down here to add to your player board itself. Now there's one other type of building that can be extended and that's your villa. Each player is going to have one or maybe multiple villas within their actual player board. These are the orange looking structures that you see here that have chimneys on yeah. them. These aren't giving you anything basically during the game, but they are allowed to be scored in some of the scoring cards. Also, they're going to be scored at the end of the game for how many chimneys you have in a completed villa. Yeah, they do add some fairly significant scoring at the end of the game, but like Jeremy said, throughout the game, they're not really going to give you much reward. There are three tiles that are single structures in and of themselves. You have a bread factory, you have fountains, and then you have market stalls. The bread factories obviously are going to give you a singular bread. They have grass all the way around them, so they can be placed just about anywhere. You have the market stalls, which are going to give you a single coin, and then you have the fountains, which are going to allow you to draw two cards from the fountain deck and keep one of them. Yeah, the fountain cards are going to basically give you end of game scoring. Now this is cool because it's going to be hidden from everyone else. Like Jeremy said, you take two of these, you take a look at them, you choose one to keep, and then you're gonna put the other one on the bottom of the fountain pile. Now, if you do that again, if you acquire another fountain in your player board, you're gonna draw two more. The cool thing is you can discard the one that you took before. So you're always gonna basically keep a progressively growing collection of fountain cards that are best suited for you. Also, anytime you build over any of the locations on your board that have one of the band rolls, you're gonna remove that band roll and move up one on this track uh, as such. You also have the ability to move freely on this track here. At any given time, you can spend one bread to bypass the normal rules of following those bylines and go to any location that still have available tiles. Yeah, and that becomes key because on a seven-pointed star, it's going to take you a while to get around to certain areas. So using a bread at just the right time to get that tile you need. And these tiles are tight. They come out randomly. And if there's only one yellow building and you need it, and so does your opponent, you better grab it fast. Now, you may ask yourself, well, what happens if you go to a location or the only locations that you can go to are empty? Well, aha, there's a rule for that. You simply are going to bounce off of that location and keep moving. So there are situations in the game as the round starts to come to a, a conclusion where you have multiple empty spaces. You need to be bouncing around until you find a spot that has a tile. And again, you're going to collect that tile. Now remember, you're trying to connect all these different buildings, all these different farmlands, and build out your farm structure or your villa structure. The other thing you're trying to do is you're looking at the frame of your board, trying to get locations across these bylines. Now, you're gonna score victory points at the end of the game. For instance, in this tile, if I have a lake, in any of these lower sections that crosses this byline, but you only get five points, period. If I have multiple lakes, it's just worth five points, period. Right, and those have to be completed. In most cases, almost everything has to be completed on your board in order to score for it, except some of the scoring cards related to chimneys. The other thing you're going to be doing while you're placing this is looking at those scoring cards. Yeah. This should drive almost every move you make because right. If at the end of a round, you're not able to achieve any of these scoring cards, and they are all very specific, you're not only going to not get points, but you might end up losing points. Let's talk about that. Once all the tiles have been taken, you're going to complete the round. And starting with the player that is furthest along this banderol track, that is how you're going to place one of your scoring markers. Everyone's going to start with four of these, meaning that there are four rounds in the game. When you place your score marker, you're going to notice these circles that are between the cards. That means that once I place that here, I'm gonna to try to score both of these cards. This will remain there for the rest of the game, blocking that. I don't get to score that on residual rounds. It's a one-time score and it's done. So as the game progresses, you can start locking yourself out and other players out of very specific card combinations to score points. Yeah, so to take Jeremy's example here, he needs one leaf and three chickens to hand in to score these points. Now here's the other place where bread can come into play. We'll also talk about that coin. But in bread, you can use three bread to achieve any one card. So for instance, if you had no chickens, you could go here, trade in three bread and say, I achieved that card, I get the seven points. In fact, if you had six bread, you can trade those in and score it twice. That's the cool thing about these scoring cards is they can be scored not multiple times throughout the game, 
but multiple times at once. The other thing you can use is coins. So say you don't, you, say you have two chickens and a coin. You can use the coin as a chicken. You can use a coin as anything effectively to fulfill a lot of these resource-oriented cards. Some other things we need to mention briefly about scoring is some of the cards are going to have red, some of them are going to have green. The red simply means you are turning in those particular resources to score those particular victory points. The green just means you have to have achieved that at any given point during the game on your player board itself. Now, what happens if you can't meet those goals? Yeah. So, like I said earlier, you're not only going to not get any points, but you're going to lose points. If you place your token in a place between two cards, say you can achieve one of them, but you can't achieve the other and you don't have any bread and you don't have any coins, you're going to lose four points for any card like that. Uh, mine and Jeremy's first game, uh, we actually got to the situation where we hadn't really been looking at the scoring. The round was over because we were so consumed with building little sections. Right that we only could score one card for each of us. So we did lose four points. And in fact, I think we it was kind of a wash. That's why it's so important to look at the very start of the round, what you're trying to do on your player board. Then you're gonna reseed the board with all new tiles in each of these locations. You're gonna pass the player marker to the next player on your left, and you're gonna do that four times. And at the end of the game, you're gonna score a multitude of victory points. Like any stuff on Feld game, <laughs> this is a complete point salad. Of course, any of the victory points that you've collected through the course of the game are obviously going to be added to that total, but there's a variety of other things that are going to be added. You're going to look at all the resources that you haven't used in that given uh, game, and you're going to divide that number by two. So you're just going to add all those up and divide it by two, and that's how many extra victory points you're going to get for one of the things. Yeah, that's literally every resource on the table. Yep. Money, bread, resources, and in fact, even tiles that you've taken that you may not have been able to place, because right. that's going to happen at times. And you can even choose to not place, and then you're going to place those right over there. Sure. In addition to that, you're going to be looking at the banner roll track. We said this at the beginning. You simply look at where you are on the banner roll track and take the points under your piece. You're going to look at your player board and the frame all the way around it. You're going to look at each of these different sections, and you're going to see if you meet all the criteria, any of the criteria for these. For instance, I'm looking at my board, which you probably can't see. I need to have a villa down this line, and I need to have bread factories down this line. If I have that, I'm getting three, then four points. Again, those do not stack. So if you have more of them, they just simply do not count. Yeah, and then you're also going to look like we said earlier, at your fountain cards. These fountain cards are pretty straightforward. This one, for instance, gives me two points for every gray building I have. Should be noted, too, that there's two of each type of fountain card in that deck, so you could get two of these same one, and they do stack. The final way to score victory points is to look at your completed villas. That, again, are all these orange buildings on your player board. You're going to count only the completed structures. They don't matter if they're connected or not. They just have to be completed. And you're going to look at all the chimneys, and you're going to look at the player board here, and it's going to tell you how many victory points. These range from two to 26 victory points. You get quite a bit from that. Right. This is like any Stefan Fell game. You can get your points throughout the game. You can get your points at the end of the game. You can rush for points at the beginning of the game. Right. So, guys, that is Carpe Diem. Let's talk about the actual review itself. Yeah. What do you think? I, I really like it. This is, I would say, I'm a Feld fan. This is probably up in the top five Felds for me, I would say. Maybe even higher. The okay. difference here is that this, to me, feels like maybe, I don't want to say it's a light game, but it's definitely not medium to heavy. It's definitely, I would say, medium maybe leaning down towards light because the game is so simple to play. Of course, all of his games are simple to play, but there's not there's not a ridiculous amount of decision making to go. Like when you play Castles of Burgundy, you have to know a lot about different things that do different things. There's just a there's not a lot of buildings to use here. The great thing about this game, there is a layered approach on how you are able to build out this board and what you're thinking about here and how they coordinate with this and what you're trying to get with victory points and what you're trying to negate other people to doing because you're not only playing for your player board but as you look around the board there is hate drafting in this game oh absolutely for sure you're picking tiles that you know people need in order to do something to maybe help you in a future round or just to stop them from scoring the other thing I'll like I'll say before I get into my negatives is the scoring structure is brilliant. Like I love yeah. this is this is one of the best things about the game. There's 60 of these scoring cards and you're going to take a few from A, B, C and D. The combinations with 60 cards. I I didn't do the math, but it's got to be tens of thousands, no, maybe it's hundreds be of crazy. thousands. We've played this a number of times and there's a ton of cards I still haven't seen. Yeah, exactly. All that's brilliant. The things I have negative about the game and this kind of goes into just Aaliyah in and of itself. 
I love Euro games, and this is completely in my wheelhouse when you talk about the game. But when you talk about the components, I, I don't know what's with Aaliyah or Ravensburger, but this game looks dated. I mean, it's 2018, and you look at games like Coimbra, you look at games like Marco Polo, all these Euros that fall in the same category that have really updated art, graphic design, even components and the style and look of the game, this just feels really dated in, the, in 2018. I, I would definitely agree with that. I would say, and I was the, the king of feeling this way way back in the day. I mean, I feel Castles of Burgundy feels that same way. Um, it is interesting that it seems like they've really just embraced the idea of like, we're making these hardcore Euros. They're gonna look like traditional Euros. Sure. Um, I do think like, I know you and I agree on this, there's room to sort of bring Euros into the more modern market with different graphic design, better graphic design. This definitely does have that sort of like very basic dry Euro look. Yeah. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention sort of on my pros, and I think, and you might agree, this is probably the biggest pro for me. The variability of this game is completely off the charts. Sure. Like not only the scoring cards, which we already talked about, but the way these player boards with these frames will line up and the very basic fact that these tiles are gonna come out in a very different fashion every single time. Now, there's not an incredibly long laundry list of tiles. There's a very basic few. And as you play the game, you'll recognize there's a, just a handful of a few, like you know these turns for the farmlands. There's only one of those in the entire stack of for tiles. For grapes, right. So for grapes and for the, the chicken coop and yeah. things like that. So once you start to play, you'll really start to recognize sort of the rarity of some of these things. Um, but like I said, the variability is off the charts. Uh, I'm going to go back to the negatives. Uh, <laughs> the, I, I'm uh, blue-green colorblind, and looking at these oh, tiles yeah. is really hard. One of them is supposed to be darker. One of them is supposed to be lighter. Uh, I can kind of tell, but not really. These are really hard to, to see. Uh, the other thing is a lot of the, or two of the buildings in particular, the bread and the one that allows you to convert are the market, brown yeah. and then less brown. And yeah. they're really hard to see the, you know, even the, the look of them is exactly the same. The shape is the same. Even the, um, the pattern on them is the same. So when you play them, there's been instances where I played a tie out. I'm like, oh, I did this. And you're like, no, you, oh, you, absolutely. Did, you didn't complete that. You completed something else. I'm like, well, okay, well, they want my strategy because <laughs> the color is weird. Uh, the other one negative uh, is these cards. I don't know why they didn't do a scoring track. I, yeah, I'm no not sure either. So cards. Th yeah, at the beginning of the game, everyone gets some victory points. And that's, of course, because you can lose points during scoring. Mm -hmm. But I don't see any reason why we couldn't have just positioned our player pieces around a scoring track either because at the end of the game in particular mm. it gets very cumbersome to sit there and sort out all of the points that you've scored and we you might run out of ones and threes and you yeah. kind of have to keep track of some of those points in your head so to be very clear on my part I think the gameplay is is wonderful it's probably gonna hit both of our top tens yeah. this year I can't imagine it not being a brilliant game I don't like the graphic design I don't like the components that may be just me I like classic heroes but I think that the, the market needs to evolve a little bit more. So yeah, agreed. The big the, the big takeaway here, I think, is despite the graphic design, like yeah. many other games, this game's probably going to end up, like Jeremy said, on our top ten list at the end of the year. So the gameplay is absolutely there. If you guys are at Essen, go get this one. I highly suggest it. Carpe Diem from Aaliyah Ravensburger, two to four players, sixty minutes or less. It's yeah, fast. very fast-paced game. Fast game. If you guys have any questions, make them in the comments below. Subscribe to us, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and everything else that we do, and we'll catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.